thank you, Erica, so much for the introduction. Uh, today's presentation is going to be introduction to naturescaping, incorporating native plants into the home landscape. Um, so in this presentation, what I'm aiming to cover is the benefits of naturescaping, how to plan and select plants for a naturescaping garden, and then what you can expect during establishment um, and helping the plants settle in during a naturescaping garden, how to maintain it once you plant it. A little bit about me, um, as Erica said earlier, I am a WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardener class of 2021. So I'm pretty new to the Master Gardener program, relatively speaking, but I'm not new to native plants. I'm not new to habitat restoration. I've been working in the industry for about six years. And then currently I am applying everything that I'm about to teach you guys in my own native pollinator garden that I'm trying to replace my lawn with. And then this is a picture of me right here in my natural habitat out at work stuck, uh, you know, hip deep up in mud, how I ought to be. So first of all, what is naturescaping? Um, there's a lot of different folks that are getting involved in naturescaping now, um, and there are a lot of different opinions and different, slightly different takes on what naturescaping is. But the way I put it is that naturescaping is just landscaping that features native plants. And I want to challenge any preconceived notions that you may have that, you know, it's something that is 110% only native plants that if you want to get involved with this, that you have to rip out all the, the lavender plants that you love and cut down your 100 year old apple tree. Um, that's not what naturescaping is all about. Naturescaping is something that, you know, it's not an all or nothing ordeal. It's something that you can have you know, within your traditional gardening goals. Um, you can have a vegetable garden with native plants in it. And, you know, as far as the benefits that a naturescaping garden would bestow, the more natives that you plant, the better. But, you know, it's as I said, again, it's not an all or nothing, all or nothing deal. Some is better than none. And so naturescaping is about, you know, filling in those pockets that you have in your garden with native plants and choosing native plants when you can and when they meet your goals. So some of the benefits, uh, the biggest one, as far as, you know, me and my gardening experience goes is that naturescaping plants and naturescaping gardens are lower maintenance. Native plants are adapted to our area. They evolved here over you know, thousands of years. And so they're used to the habitat here in the Pacific Northwest. And so they, you know, compared to other horticultural plants, they require less irrigation, less fertilizers, less pesticides to thrive in our area than non-native plants. Naturescaping gardens are also good for water. Uh, the deeper roots of trees and native plants help filter rainwater during storm events of runoff chemicals that may be in your driveway or in your lawn, and they help guide rainwater into underground aquifers. Here in Clark County, most of the tap water that you know you may have, you know, when you open up your tap comes from like underground wells. And so this benefit is very important for, for water in general. And rain gardens are a type of naturescaping garden that specializes in providing the stormwater benefit. Naturescaping gardens are also good for wildlife. Um, native plants, they provide food, shelter, and habitat for you know, local wildlife. Um, other horticultural plants, can do that too, to an extent, but native plants really excel in that because they evolved in partnership with these wildlife. Um, specifically, insects have really strong relationships with native plants. And this is something that I hope to show, you know, sort of the, the effect of native plants on wildlife populations in this graph right here. Um, on the y-axis, we have you know, a, a estimated of fledgling young surviving. And then on the, on the x-axis, no, on the y-axis is the, is the fledgling young. On the x-axis is 
percentage of non-native plants. So to explain that a little bit, if you have more non-native plants, you're having less native plants. So what this graph is showing from, from you know, the research done by Narango et al. is that the more non-native plants you have, AKA the less native plants you have, the less chickadees were surviving to fledgling in adulthood. And the reason why is that the food that they rely on, insects, caterpillars, they need native plants. So while these chickadees weren't necessarily eating native plants themselves directly, it had a big effect on their population when these native plants went away. So take home bullet points, less native plants, you're gonna experience less wildlife. And I wanted to provide a couple of examples of this. Um, I think a really well-known example of a strong relationship between insects and native plants is the monarch butterfly and the milkweed. So the monarch butterfly caterpillars feed exclusively on milkweeds. They can't feed on anything else. So monarch butterflies will lay their eggs just on milkweeds. And they will lay their, their eggs on non-native milkweeds, but it's so much better for them to do it on native milkweed plants because the milkweed plants will flower at times that are beneficial for the monarch butterflies. And so what they've seen is that like if you're planting non-native milkweed plants in your yard, um, the, the butterflies are gonna stay in a certain area in a time that's not necessarily appropriate for them to be laying their eggs in that area and they're gonna have less survival as a result. Another example of this is, you know, a little lesser known one, but more local to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the native Fender's blue butterfly relies on the Kincaid's lupin as the primary plant where it lays its eggs. Both are endangered now to a 99% loss of habitat in the Willamette Valley. So that pretty blue little butterfly, if we want to keep that around, we're going to need to start planting Kincaid's lupin in places that, you know, are now being paved over and turned into homes and businesses. So hopefully that by this point in the presentation, I've convinced you guys that naturescaping is a valuable and important thing to do. So now I'm gonna transition gears and talk a little bit about the process and how it looks like when we're actually trying to make naturescaping happen. So step number one, we're going to be deciding on our goals and assessing where we're at. Just, you know, doing some, some brainstorming and some homework and some planning. Step number two is going to be the site prep phrase. This is where we are going to be clearing away the non-native plants or the weeds that would be competing with our, with our native species. Um, it's going to really set them off on the right foot if we start with as much of a clean slate as possible. Step number three is going to be Personally, my favorite part, but I put our favorite part because I'm going to presume that you guys like this part too, planting them plants. Number four, we are going to be establishing them. That's how we're going to be supporting them while we get settled in. Um, that's going to be maintaining them, pushing back weeds, pulling out weeds, watering them for the first couple of years while they, you know, build up the resilience to start, you know, um, you know being self-reliant. And then step number five, enjoying our nature scooping garden. So in the planning phase, I think the very first most important thing to have in mind is establishing a goal. And there's so many different types of gardening goals that you can incorporate into a nature scaping thing, into a nature scaping garden. Um, it doesn't have to be just one or the other. You can have a naturescaping garden that's cottage themed. You can have an English manor naturescaping garden like they have in the Southwest Botanical Gardens up in Brush Prairie. Um, you can have a vegetable garden alongside your naturescaping garden. You can have an edible naturescaping garden. There's so many edible native plants. But starting off, you're going to want to narrow down what that goal is. So it could be any one of those things, or you could be inspired by a particular ecosystem type, like a woodland or a meadow. You could be after that backyard habitat certification, like the sign here on the right-hand side. 
rain garden, edible plants. Really, your imagination is a limit here, but every type of garden is going to have its own suite of plants that go along with it. So to get our ideas jogging, there's a couple of you know different things, different native plants that can fit in you know a traditional garden. Um, if you want a, if you if you're a fan of roses, we have three different species of native roses here in the Pacific Northwest. Picture it here is a nuca rose. This is one of, I mean, it's, look at how beautiful that is. Um, if you are into irises, we have a couple of different species of native irises. Picture right here is the Oregon iris and then rhododendrons. I see these a lot already in, in traditional gardens, um, but that's native. So you don't have to forego rhododendrons if you're interested in nature scaping. Some other ideas, we can have an edible berry nature scaping garden. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have surface berry. This is a, a larger shrub that can kind of slot into this tree category too, but it makes these little berries that taste a little bit like blueberries, but milder. On the upper right-hand side, we got evergreen huckleberry. Um, this is an evergreen plant that, you know, you can see even in the snow, it has these beautiful green, red leaves. Um, if you guys have had the, the huckleberry shakes at Burgerville, I'm sure you guys understand the value of huckleberries. And then on the lower left-hand side, we have salal, which is another beautiful evergreen plant that produces some delicious berries. So if you are about those berries, that can easily fit within a nature scaping paradigm. And then there's some options for, for lawn alternative ground covers. So if, you, if you're sick of mowing your lawn every single day, there's options that you can pick from to replace that and to save yourself that labor in terms of you know, the, the nature scaping benefits of lower maintenance. On the left-hand side, Kinnick Kinnick with the red berries is an evergreen plant that also does really, really well in full sun. I see this a lot in commercial landscaping. Uh, people will plant this alongside, you know, like parking medians. Um, in the middle is wild ginger. This is a beautiful plant that can be planted in partial and full shade, as is woodland strawberry too. And woodland strawberry produces these beautiful, cute little wild strawberries. They taste just like real strawberries, but they're little and they're cute and they're adorable. And they're also a wildlife food source too. And that woodland strawberry is pictured on the right. And this is something that I was able to actually accomplish in my own yard. So if you look at the picture on the right, that is my parking strip at my house. Um, and that picture was taken in March. Um, I dug up all of the grass that was there. There's a couple of snowberry plants planted in that picture, but they're pretty difficult to see. And then in the right hand picture is a picture that I took about July. And you can see that I seeded my parking strip with Farewell to Spring. There's a couple of other plants in there too, like Globigilia and Big Leaf Mary, but it's, it's pretty hard to see with just how amazing that farewell to spring is going right there. So, I mean, I saw butterflies just bumbling and buzzing around, hanging out all over there, like all summer long. Um, I'm pretty sure that I have like three or four butterflies that just permanently live in my garden now because of just how much forage I have there available to them. So once you have a goal in place, you're going to want to start assessing the physical conditions of your yard. Um, you're going to want to find out what nature is telling you about your yard because you're going to want to work with nature to have a really successful nature scaping garden. There will be some physical limitations to your yard. And so you'll want to know what they are to determine plants that will fit within that kind of ecosystem that you have present. Or you're going to want to start thinking about like long term, let's say if you're about a woodland garden and you have full sun yard, you're going to want to determine like, okay, what that is so you can start planting your trees. 
So sunlight, um, you can have a sunny yard, which is like six or more hours of direct sunlight. A shady yard tends to be four or less hours of direct sunlight. And then part sun, part shade is that Goldilocks zone between sun or shade. Um, and then one thing to take in mind with sunlight is that the cardinal directions will have an effect on like areas around your house. So you have a picture right here. We have the sun's path. There's two sun paths. Um, the summer sun path is, you know, the sun will be a little higher in the sky during the summer and the winter. The sun is going to be a little weaker because it's going to be lower on the horizon. But with us being in the northern half of the planet, the sun going across the, the sky during the day is going to be slightly tilted to the south. So the north side of a house or a structure is going to tend to be shadier than the south side because that sun is going to be on the south side of a house. Conversely, the east side of a house will tend to have morning sun but afternoon shade because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And the west side of the house will tend to have morning shade, but afternoon sun. And so east and west sides of the houses can either be part sun or full sun shade, depending on like what else is nearby. But the afternoon sun in the west will tend to make the west a little bit drier than the east side of the structure. So when you guys are in your planning stage and taking inventory of your site conditions, knowing your cardinal directions in relation to your house, your trees, your garage, it's gonna make it a little easier to make an informed decision about where you're gonna be putting your plants. Soil moisture is also gonna be something to take into account. Um, your soil can be wet, it could be moist, it could be dry. You're gonna to want to dig a little bit down into the root zone, which is, you know, could be anywhere from like a couple inches down to like a foot down, depending on the plant. Uh, but you're gonna to wanna to look at the soil, where the roots are gonna be at. And so in the picture you see here, there's a person with their hand and they have some, some soil in their hand. It's a little darker than, you know, the stuff right up on top. So it's a little moisture you can see. And so you're gonna to wanna to dig down and see, you know, if there's a difference in coloration, if you can feel, visible moisture in it or touchable moisture. Um, if it's still like the same color and pretty dry throughout, you can probably confidently say it's dry soil. If you open up a hole and you find water in there, that's pretty confidently wet soil or seasonally wet soil. And if you see what's pictured, then you can confidently say it's, it's moist soil. Um, there's also soil texture and nutrients to take into account when you're planning and starting a naturescaping garden. Some plants will have preferences for different contents of uh, nutrients, sandy, clay, loamy, um, or there could be a, a preference for certain pHs, for example, rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries, um, huckleberries, they tend to prefer slightly more acidic soil. And you're typically not going to know these things without testing. Um, there's a lot that could be said about soil. So I do wanna to refer to the Master Gardener video on our YouTube page of Soil Basics for Beginning Gardeners, because there's just so much to be talking about on soil and soil health here. It would easily make this a much, much longer presentation for me to go into that. But in the planning stage, I do recommend looking at your soil and considering doing some soil testing just to have an understanding of, you know, what the soil is, because that's where the plants are going to be living. So now that we know our site conditions and we know our goals and we know that we are going for a native plant, what we're going to be picking as far as species that we're going to be planting is going to be sort of, I like to think of it like the center of this Venn diagram. So let's say for a second that I am a gardener and I'm interested in edible berries. I have a shady yard, so I need something shade tolerant. And of course I'm naturescaping, so I want something native. Then I'm going to be putting those three ideas together. And then in the center, and my Venn diagram would be Salal. So pictured right here, 
is a stalol plant. Delicious berries, it's gonna do really well in the shade. And so since it meets all three of those conditions, that might be something that I would pick to plant. Now, that being said, like I, there's so much more that fits this Venn diagram, but I just, you know, have stalol there just for the, to not make this too big. Another example, if I was going for, you know, nature scaping garden, um, I'm looking for something that's pollinator friendly and I have full sun. Those three together might give me a mock orange. And so picture right here, I have a really beautiful flowering shrub with just these flowers that bumblebees go crazy over. And I wanted to share some resources that's going to help you select native plant species going forward. Um, the Portland Plant List, if you are interested in pursuing a backyard habitat certification, they use the Portland Plant List as their list of what is native to the region. So you're going to want to make sure that if you're going for the uh, backyard habitat certification, that you're familiarizing yourself with the Portland Plant List. Uh, the Clark Conservation District, WSU Extension Publications, WSU Master Gardeners Answer Clinics, your native specialty nursery staff, they're all really good resources that you can tap and ask questions about in terms of trying to find plants that suit your property. But I want to show you the WSU Extension Plant Pacific Northwest Plants Database. This is a really cool tool that you know you can check these boxes and then click search and it'll generate a list for you that meet those needs. So if I was you know doing this thing again, I would maybe click the natives box right here. I would click um, you know attracting butterflies if I was doing my pollinator garden and then click search and it's going to generate a list for me that meets those needs. In our planning stage, we're also gonna to wanna to take into consideration what type of plant material that we wanna use. There's a couple of different options that we have available to us as gardeners. Number one would be seeds, two containers or three bare roots. And I'll go into a little bit of the, the pros and cons of each as a residential homeowner and why we might want to use one over another. So seeds, these are pretty recognizable. They, they tend to be the cheapest option. You can get a lot of seeds, buy them on the internet or from Willamette Wildings or this store or that store. And a little packet might only cost you a couple of bucks or you could even get like pounds of it for, for 20, 30, 40 bucks, depending on what it is. They're pretty easy to transport and store, uh, but there are some cons. Some species are gonna need special treatment to germinate. So some seeds, some native plants will have a coating on top that you'll need to take some kind of extra step to remove, such as freezing it or scarification, which is some you know, other different methods of removing that seed coat. They have a time investment too. So you're not going to just put a seed in the ground and have instant plant. You are going to have to sit there and wait for that seed to grow into the size of plant that you want. And they're time sensitive too. Um, depending on the time of year, if you're direct sowing outdoors or if you're starting them inside, there is going to be needing to be some kind of calculations and consideration you're going to need to do for how early you want to start the seeds versus when you want to bring them outside. Um, you are going to need to have some ID skills if you're going to go the direct sow, sow route out in the soil um, because you know you're going to need to know when you're coming through and weeding later like is that your precious native plant or is that a weed and then there's going to be you are going to have to think about like how you're going to keep birds off of those seeds if you direct sow them outside because those are going to be some tasty little treats for those birdies so some folks may choose to you know, lay out some hay over top of it to make the seeds a little harder for birds to find. But do know that you may experience some seed loss in terms of birds eating those seeds if you just sow them outside in the, in the yard. Next is gonna be container plants. This I think is most recognizable for most gardeners. 
But in terms of shopping, this is also one of the most expensive options per plant. Um, but this is, there are some benefits to this. Um, this is pretty common to find in nurseries. And then the soil present inside the pot does serve to help provide some buffer to transplant shock, which is when you know the plant undergoes some stress from being planted in a new environment. You can theoretically plant them any time of year, more on this later. So you can plant a container plant in the summer, you can plant them in the fall, you can plant them essentially whenever you can buy them. And you can also get much, much larger plants, which is nice for if you have a spot right away that you want filled up, or if you're going for a little bit of a quicker path to your gardening goal. Bare roots is a little less of a typical option in a garden nursery setting. Um, we do use this pretty extensively in habitat restoration, uh, but this is a dormant plant without soil. There is some really nice benefits to this, um, but they are seasonally limited. So they're typically sold in winter due to the fact that they are dormant and they are without soil. But because they don't have any soil attached to them, they're really easy to transport in large amounts. Um, at my work, we buy these bare roots in, in bags. I'll have like maybe 500 plants in a bag that's just like maybe three feet long and a foot or two high. So you can get a lot of plants for your buck and for your space too. Imagine trying to, you know, corral 500 of these guys in that same amount of space. It's gonna be a big logistical challenge for the containers, less so for the bare roots. So this is a really good option if you have like acreage or larger properties that you're trying to get plants in. They are really easy to plant versus, you know, container plants for a container plant, you're gonna to need to dig a much larger hole, but for bare roots, you essentially need to just crack open a hole big enough to put the roots in. That being said, Bear roots are time sensitive. So keep in mind like these plants are without their soil for the time being, you're gonna to wanna to get them into the ground as soon as possible after purchase because you don't want those plants exiting dormancy without like the, the water and the nutrients available for them to continue growing and being healthy. So we'll talk about shopping for native plants. There are a couple of different angles that you can go at, different routes and avenues you can explore. Conventional nurseries, such as Dennis 70s, formerly known as Shorties, Yard and Garden Land. Um, these, are, these are all right. Uh, they're a viable option for purchasing our most common native plants like sword fern. Um, I tend to be kind of disappointed in the variety of the stock. And I have seen in the past, you know, experiences of getting confused over scientific names or versus common names. So I'd say if you're going the conventional nursery route or if you're shopping there for your plants, bring a list of scientific names just to make sure that there isn't any, you know, confusion. Because there's a lot of things called, um, you know, say goat's beard. There are some native specialty nurseries that I can recommend. Um, these are all really great places that either I've bought plants at or I would buy plants at. So Goodyear Farms up in Washuga, Washington, Bosque Dell Natives in Westland, Oregon, Watershed Garden Works in Longview, Washington. A Sparrowhawk is an online pop-up nursery that they do sales all over the Portland metro area. Willamette Wildings is online. And then the Clark County Conservation District has a seasonal plant sale in May, as does the Nature Scaping Wildlife Botanical Gardens. These are all really, really great places that, that I've had a lot of success with in terms of shopping for plants, shopping for specific native plants, and having just a real good variety to shop from. There are also some other avenues that you can explore for finding discounted trees. So Friends of Trees this is a volunteer organization. They work really hard to provide resources and trees for homeowners interested in planting trees in their yard. They do a variety of different species um, from the horticultural end all the way to the native end. They do provide native options as well. And then the city of Vancouver has a tree fund program. So 
The urban forestry department in the city offers a 50% refund for approved trees. You're gonna to have to go on to the urban forestry website and like explore what that list is, but there are some native trees on that list. So there's a lot of things to have considered during the planning phase um, to summarize that back all up and package it up again. For planning, you're gonna to wanna to identify your goals, assess your yard's physical condition, find native plants that fit both your goals and your yard conditions, and determine what type of plant material you're gonna use and how to source them, because that's gonna determine when you can plant or when you can do which step. Moving on to site prep. So before you plant your native plants or even before you even buy them, I really, really recommend to remove as much of the competition, the weeds as possible. They're gonna reduce your native plants ability to find light water nutrients. I can recommend mowing, hand weeding, mulching, herbicide. They're all methods that you can use to remove weeds. What the best method is, is going to vary depending on the weed species and how much you need to do is also going to vary depending on what type of plant material you're gonna be putting in. As you can see here in the picture for my yard strip, I seeded that. So to reduce as much competition as possible for the seedlings, I took it down to bare dirt. So that may be something you're gonna to have to do for seeding, but for larger plants, maybe not so. Maybe just mowing them down so that there's not too much going on over there, that they're not getting overtopped from sunlight. For recommending best method for the weeds, I recommend looking at HortSense. Um, this is a WC resource and they have a section dedicated to weeds for recommendations of like what kinds of methods you're gonna be taking for what kind of weeds. Um, so you're gonna be doing something different if you're tackling dandelions versus um, Himalayan blackberry. And so WCU HortSense, I highly recommend checking that out if you have a problem weed that you just don't know how to work with. The site prep phase is also going to be the best time to do a soil amendment at this time if you think it's desirable or necessary. Um, I recommend seeking a professional soil test, and this is going to give you the best recommendations on which amendments you should be using for particular soil conditions. Moving on to the planting stage, one thing that I, if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from this is location, location, location is gonna make a huge difference in the success of your plantings. Make sure that you're matching the physical location of your plant with the plant's requirements. Um, so for example, planting shade loving plants in a shady spot, sun loving plants in a sunny spot. Remember, right plant for right spot is key. Another thing to be thinking about is considering the plant's mature size in the space that it's going to be going in. So you'll see on the right hand side that I have a picture of this poor pine tree. It got planted a little too close to the power line and so it got really chopped and hacked up in the process of, you know, the, the power companies coming through and making sure that those power lines are protected. Um, so that might be a consideration if you're planning on planting trees on your site or on your property, look up and see, you know, how big is this tree going to get and is it going to grow up in a spot where it's going to be in conflict with power lines later on. But that's the same for like, you know, shrubs too, of like if you are putting it in a certain spot, think about the mature height or mature size of that shrub. Is it going to be too big for that spot? When it comes to planting, I also recommend starting big and working to small. So what I mean by that is planting your larger trees and shrubs first before planting your smaller plants. You'll see here in the picture I have a one on the tree, a two on the sword fern, and a three on some of the wild ginger right there at the bottom. This is because larger plants will serve as design acres in terms of you know, aesthetics, um, you can see that they really planted around this tree and had this tree be a focal point in that particular garden setting. 
but larger plants may also influence the physical climate of the location. So this tree right here is obviously providing a lot of shade for the other plants around it. But even this little sword fern too is providing a deeper pocket of shade for the plants right next to it. When it comes to planting, the timing of the year is also going to really matter. The worst time to plant native trees and shrubs and flowers is summer because they're gonna be contending with a lot of heat stress and they won't be settled in or have a root mass root system developed enough to help them cope with that. My recommendation in terms of the best time of year to plant trees, flowers, shrubs, is gonna be late fall and winter or late winter. This is gonna give time for healthy roots to grow before summer. That being said, you can plant your trees and shrubs whatever time of year you like, but just know that if you're planting it in summer or even late spring, it gets a little dicier in terms of the plant's likelihood of survival. Um, in the restoration industry, we tend to be done with most of our planting projects by May or so. And if we have clients asking us to put in plants after that, it tends to come with this conversation of like, hey, you know that this might not work out. You know this, if we do this in June, you please, please, please understand that this might not survive. Moving on to step number four, the establishment phase. You're going to need to expect to give extra attention to your native plants during the first two years or so as they settle into their new location and become established. So I'll go into a little bit about what that's gonna look like. Watering and mulch is my biggest recommendations for helping plants out during this establishment phase. Water frequently during the summer during the first two years, and then afterwards, the plants will tend to be a little bit more settled in, a little bit more self-reliant. Um, after the first couple of years, when the plants are starting to grow and get big, you know, I recommend to just kind of eyeball it from there, look for signs of heat stress or water stress and water in response to that at that time. Um, and then I highly recommend mulch. Mulch is going to do a lot to help keep the soil moist. So you'll see right here in this picture, I have a mulch ring surrounding this tree. It is quite thick, quite dense, but it's not piled up along the stem because that's something that will preserve moisture without keeping too much moisture on the stem of the tree. Um, if there's too much moisture on the stem of the tree, that may rot it some. But weed competition is also going to be a step you're going to be looking at during the establishment phase. Um, control weeds near your native plant. As I said earlier, um, they're going to be competing with your plants for nutrients, for light, for water. And then once again, I really recommend a layer of mulch. And for weed competition, you're going to want a thick, thick layer. So two to three inches of mulch is going to do a great for suppressing weeds. Other maintenance steps, um, if you come from a traditional gardening background, you may feel tempted to fertilize. You may be feeling tempted to prune. Um, I'd say avoid fertilizing unless it's really, really becoming apparent that it's necessary. Unless Avoid fertilizing unless your plants are telling you that they need nutrients. That's because our native plants are adapted to our native soils. So fertilizing can burn native plants and over overfeed them. You can overfeed native plants. So I'd say avoid doing that because they're not going to need it anyways. Pruning generally isn't necessary for native plant health either. Um, pruning, if I remember, you know, from my master gardener class, you know, I was told pruning is for people. That holds true for native plants as well. They generally do not need pruning in order to be healthy and happy. Now, if you want to prune them, if you have a specific shape you have in mind, like you're trying to make a pretty hedge, you can prune your plants. If the flower heads on the plant are spent, you can prune those off. But for generally speaking, for a healthy native plant, it's not necessary unless, you know, there's something else going on there. So I wanted to give you guys some other inspiration before I leave you off with, um, the presentation. 
I have some images from backyardhabitats.org of just some people who made native meadows where they're at. So on the picture on the left, you can see native plants. They have self heal. They have yarrow. On the picture on the right, they have a lot of checker mallow. They have more yarrow again. But I just kind of want to show you a little bit of what's possible right there. Um, in this slide right here, we can see that they have a bunch of woodland plants um, on the right, on the left hand side, even just mixed in with their garden path and their yard decorations. Um, on the right hand picture, we have some false Solomon seals, some um, bleeding heart. And then on the right hand picture is actually an image of the Northwest Natives Garden in the Southwest Botanical Nature Scaping Gardens up in Brush Prairie. And you can see that, you know, they have, you know, all these native plants mixed around a, um, a you know, little path and they have a water feature there. You can get really creative with this is just the point that I'm going at. And last but not least, I wanted to show you a really fantastical example of nature scaping that you can go out and visit anytime. This is the Confluence Land Bridge that goes over Highway 14. Um, this is right next to Fort Vancouver in the downtown area. And they're, they're even doing nature scaping on this kind of scale, um, going across the, the high five or the, the 14. Um, but just to you know, inspire and jug your, jug your brains and let you know what's possible. So I have some key takeaway points for you guys. Um, native plants, they're lower maintenance, they're good for water, and they're good for wildlife. Nature scaping can be incorporated in traditional gardening goals and designs. It's not an all or nothing deal with a nature scaping garden. Select native plants that fit both your goals and your physical conditions. Do some site prep before you start planting. Remove those weeds before you start planting. Plant or sow seed late fall through early spring, and then plan to do some maintenance in the first few years before your plants take off. All right, so that was my presentation. Thank you so much. I wanted to show you guys, uh, I have a slide right here for some resources. So if you are interested in finding more information, on the right hand side, we have links to the Portland Plant List, WC HortSense. The Master Gardener Answer Clinic, they can provide answers to questions that you have. Simply Soil Testing is a company that provides professional soil testing. There's a Master Gardener YouTube channel if you want to find that soil video that I was talking about. And then also a link to the WCU Pacific Northwest Plants Database. Some of the places that I recommend for buying native plants is on the left hand side over there. And um, if you guys have any questions at this time, I'll be taking questions. Great, Heather, thank you so much. Um, yes, please put your questions in the chat box. We will select some uh, to relay to Heather. Um, and if your question is not answered, please feel free to send it to the Answer Clinic. The email address for that is mganswerclinic at clark.wa.gov, and you can find that information on our website. Heather, the questions have been coming in and I'm gonna go ahead and relay a couple of them to you. Uh, the first one here is, um, what mulch do you recommend that doesn't attract bugs like ants or termites? So I can't speak too much about what attracts ants or termites, um, but I can say I've mulched personally in my own yard and I've not had any, any problems with ants or termites in my yard. Um, that being said, like I wasn't very selective about what kind of mulch I put down. Um, I went and got mulch through ChipDrop, which is a free service. You can sign up online and you can connect with arborists where, you know, at the end of the workday, they're looking to get rid of, you know, what they chipped up for the rest of the day. Um, I had um, some cedar chips and I didn't experience termites or ants or anything with that, um, but you know, it may be different with other species, but typically that's that's not something that I ran into too much. So Heather, would you say generally a woody mulch is going to be your best bet? I know some folks use inorganic materials such as rocks. What, what, what are some of your recommendations as far as the type? 
it kind of depends on, you know, more what you're going for, but for weed suppression and um, that moisture barrier, I would recommend more of a woody mulch. You're going to get more, you know, coverage of that. Um, now, if you want to like for sure 110% avoid those termites, those ants, the, the rocks may be the way to go, but unless you are getting very, very fine gravel, and even then if you do get fine gravel, there's gonna be some weed seeds that are gonna pop up through the, you know, through the soil underneath. Um, I have like a little mulch driveway that I'm constantly weeding, but with a thick enough layer of mulch around your native plants, it's going to decompose over time, but it's also going to do better at retaining that moisture and blocking out all light. Great, thanks Heather. The next question asks, are there resources to help plan for climate forward plants? And by this, I am interpreting that to mean as our climate warms. Do you know of any resources that help folks to prepare for that uh, warming climate? Um, this is something that I have done some re reading about, um, but I don't have any native or plants, any resources for that at this time in terms of this presentation. That's a really, really big topic, and that is something that I know a lot of folks are interested in right now is future-proofing their yards for um, climates. I would say that, you know, in terms of a naturescaping approach, you can explore plants that do really well in sun and heat and look at plants that have also occur in California, too. So, Heather, maybe this is something we could explore for a talk later on. I would love to. Great. Uh, another question is, what kind of pest control would you recommend for a naturescaping garden? How can you avoid using pesticides and herbicides? For herbicides, I would really recommend, again, mulching um, very, very well, um, doing a lot of really good site prep and, um, you know, really doing your best to start with a clean slate before you start planting plants. I think for weeds, prevention is going to be key before you start putting your plants in the ground. Um, that being said, there are a couple of different approaches that you can take once you're planted and weeds start popping up hand pulling, uh, weeding, um, mowing them down, um, doing your best to like look at where they're popping up. And if there's a certain like sort of species that's popping up, I'd say I tend to see weeds pop up in areas where there's opportunity. So making sure that there isn't opportunity for weeds to pop up, planting areas up, um, making sure that there's not bare ground anywhere as much as possible. For pests like insects, I'd say that a lot of our native plants tend to be pretty resilient to pests. But I would recommend that if you start finding pests that are causing a lot of damage to your garden, to look them up on HortSense or Seek Master Gardener um, Answer Clinic Help. And I might add too, if I can, that um, insect pests are typically attracted to plants that are stressed. So if your plants are getting good care, they're less likely to draw in pests. And also when you attract beneficials, such as ladybugs and some of the other predatory insects, they will manage your pests for you. So naturescaping is another great um, aspect of, of that uh, interaction. Um, let's look at a couple more here. Uh, there is a question asking about what are resources for soil testing. Heather, can you talk about um, what Master Gardeners offer in terms of soil testing, or, or would you like me to handle that? Um. I'm a little less familiar with that area of the Master Gardener program. So can you take that, Erica? Yeah, so um, there are some great options for soil testing and we have a soil test kit on our website and it's also accessible if you contact the answer clinic. The soil test kit includes some information on why and why not uh, to do soil testing. And then it has um, an indication of what kinds of things you might want to include in your soil testing and what kinds of things may not be necessary. It also has a link to some of the more common soil testing facilities. So I would say contact the answer clinic or check our website for that. Um, Heather, there's another question. I'm, I'm not sure if you can answer or not, but it's, can you explain what the backyard habitat certification is? Are you able to tell folks about that? The backyard habitat certification is a program, I believe it's put on through the Columbia Land Trust and the Portland Audubon Society in partnership. Um, what that typically entails, and I may be completely wrong, I'm not super familiar with this program, but um, they will 
have a technician come out to your property, give you recommendations on how you can become more of a wildlife friendly habitat in your yard. And then um, you can seek different certification levels depending on how much of your property you nature scape or how much of your property you, know, you commit to providing benefits and resources for wildlife. Does that answer that question? That's great. Thanks, Heather. Um, a couple more here. Um, what are your thoughts regarding using hazelnut shells as mulch around perennials? Um, I'd say that you probably have to go pretty deep with that to make sure that there's not any light reaching the soil, but I have seen some gardeners use that successfully. Great. Um, I think we'll make this the last one. The question is, is it better to not use landscaping fabric, fabric to suppress weeds, or is it okay to use it where you would want to keep a pathway? It sort of depends on your ultimate goal. I would say that if you want an area to stay completely weed free, the landscape fabric is going to be highly effective in that. Um, now, that being said, it doesn't decompose over time. So it does kind of hinder some of the natural soil processes in terms of, you know, aeration and access to insects over time. Um, so I would tend to use it a little bit more towards just paths, but I have used it in other areas of my garden where I just really didn't want to weed like ever. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. 